or Spencer? Hello. 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 Can't see, him. Can't, can't see you yet. It's because I'm John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for the uninitiated, people who don't know who you are, I've been living under a rock for all of this time. Can you tell us who you are, what you do? My name is Spencer. Whoa, I'm on both screens right now, it's tight. Uh, I do dog <laughs> toys, I play music. Uh, I'm a new father and I have a dog. <laughs> me. Wow, I mean, we've had a lot of artists introduce themselves. Like no one has really ever talked about their dogs or uh, children. Dog man, <laughs> well, I get, I, I you guess we know. It, man. I guess we know uh, what's important. So, um, I kind of, I guess what I talked to Jenky about in the last interview is I actually don't remember where I met you. You've sort of always like been in my life, and I have yeah. this like I don't remember like this one moment, and so in my mind, it's like I, it's the same way I feel about like janky i don't even know where i met scott like there's some people you just meet people and then they're just part of like your life and then i don't know like i could have known you for like 20 years it's it's weird yeah we, i think we met in the early 30s and then <laughs> a lot of contact uh no i met you actually pretty recent or pretty quickly after i got into the game um mm -hmm. one of the guys though, who i first kind of met in the scene was this dude john Pryor. he does dollar slice uh, mm -hmm. um and he kind of introduced me to you. Uh, he was like, yo, I'm coming down, drop off some pieces, come check out the warehouse. Did you come with John the first time? I think so, I think so. Okay, right. It and might then... the might've been the old office actually. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. And then I saw you at that, that Long Beach zine fest, right? Yeah, you came to the first event that I tabled at. It was a zine fest that my friend Evan was doing and he and I split a table and you came in. Right. And I was like, whoa. Now, now it's all becoming clear to me yeah um, man i i just um i forget what the thing is but like humans like you can kind of keep track of maybe like like five people like really closely like you know what they're doing today and what they had for breakfast kind of thing and then there's like a, sort of like this other outer circle of you know, maybe a dozen or two dozen people, and then that your your maximum is like 150 or 200 people. Like, and I am at my max. So when I meet someone for the first time, they sort of kind of go, like they don't exist to me until I have to interact with them in some way. Like I have to like I even have conversations with people on the phone who call and want to make something and. I don't even remember that conversation. You know, I usually start by asking people, so have we spoken before? And they're like, no, no, this is the first time I reached out. Like, okay. And then I start at the beginning. And sometimes they'll be like, oh, yeah, you told me all that stuff. It's like, okay. Like, I, it's just it's yeah. too, too many things. Um, so let's just talk about your piece here just really quickly because you sold out. So awesome. So anyone who's watching now who didn't get one of those, tough shit. Um, <laughs> so um, I think what really put you on my radar was the the Simpsons toys. And I was, you know, I collect a lot of Bart bootlegs. Um, can you tell me about how you started with Bart? And Yeah. Oh, Ann, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. You didn't. Uh, I sort of cut myself off after I, you know, half formulated a question that sounded decent. So I abandoned the rest of it. But you were for a while there. I mean, you still make stuff all the time. I know you're doing a lot of commission jobs for a lot of people. But for a while there, you were putting out. I mean, I think I might have more Simpsons figure, Simpsons related figures from you than any other artist because there was a time where you were just like it was seemed like every week it was like boom 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 and you kept that pace up i don't know for a year two yeah around around about that yeah so i started basically kind of just pushing myself to do releases every week for a while there with the barts um Jeez. and then after a while kind of took a step back and didn't really want to be known as just the simpsons guy and that kind of uh 
meshed when I started getting a lot of commissions. The I don't really like to talk about the stuff that I'm doing for other people because I'm not putting my logo on it and like I'm not really putting it like that. So it, it appears that I'm kind of like off the grid, but I'm actually doing doing it's some nice big stuff. Just people. to tell people that you do it because you know you've gotten some significant commissions where people come to you and ask you to make fifty and a hundred figures and yeah 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 pretty yeah, consistent so. he was doing 60 to like uh, 150 figures for a clothing company for a while and then that those toys kind of parlayed into doing some other stuff for some other people and some one-off stuff and kind of just some random fun commissions and some some cool collaborations actually come from that and you'll be seeing some of the effects of that very very soon nice. like like potentially end of the month and then like end of summer is going to be some really cool la stuff so um was bart the first i mean how did you get let's start at the beginning how did you get into resin toy making how did that become a medium of expression for you so i ended up having a bit of time like uh i do music i play in a band called trash talk and we were starting to have longer and longer break between tours which kind of allowed me a little bit more time to kind of explore what else made me tick and I got back into sculpting, which is something that I really liked to do when I was younger, but just kind of fell out of doing it and just didn't really explore it. Uh, I started uh, to kind of like what I was doing and wanted to begin painting it, but also at the same time, didn't want to ruin my original piece by painting them. So I looked up how to, uh, how to like duplicate the sculptures. I didn't even know anything about casting at that point. Didn't really know what I was going to be getting my, uh, myself into, but as it progressed, I started to learn about how I could potentially break the, like, you know, my, my piece as I made the mold. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do some shit. I don't really care about grab this toy and duplicate that. And then kind of like organically got into kit bashing. And then from there learned that there was actually this whole world and this whole, you know, this whole thing that's going on and that many of the toys I liked when I was a kid were essentially kit bashed <laughs> in the, you know, in some guy's shop somewhere. And that kind of just really set it up and really just dove head first. And I met a few people and I actually bought a Scott Cherry toy. Uh, I joined the Barbarian Friendship Club. <laughs> Sucker. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? It's the worst $10 I ever spent. <laughs> no, but I got the coin and the little figure and I was like, you know what? Like, I can do this. This dude's like super approachable. Like, this looks easy as hell to do, which is actually, it's really not, but it, it was, it, it came in the, and that's what, that's like actually what I think is one of the benchmarks of like, like an artist, like, is if it's easy, if it looks easy to do, if it looks like it comes naturally and like that you could do it, inspires you to do it. then that's, that's what speaks to me. And I think that's pretty cool. So kudos to you, Scott. And that's, that was the diving board. Nice. And so, um, did I ask you like your first figure was what? My first figure was this character called Stormo, and it was a uh, a stormtrooper, uh, an Imperial stormtrooper um, Pez dispenser that I just like filled out the back with clay, and uh, did the head from that. And then it was like a uh, like a six inch vinyl Mario figure. Mm -hmm. It was a super clunky little guy. It was uh, from, from a line called Tar Stars, and it was this whole world where they basically worked in like a, a, an oil refinery that exploded that like you know had like this huge fire and blew up and at this like explosion they created a rift in the space-time continuum and these guys <laughs> through the realm and it was the car stars and then this guy stormo came out and he was like the classic heel so it was this like weird like cartoon comic strip hopping like you know this weird guy but i may start re like revisiting that but i may not who knows <laughs> I think that, that was the first figure you gave me, right? Yeah, it was this clunky, like, uh, I, I think I painted him entirely in one shot. So it was just like this really thick black, like, <laughs> they look sick, man. They squeak, <laughs> they're articulated, they're peg articulated, they squeak when you move them. Like, it came with a little cigarette. They, they, they look like shit. Uh, I've come a long way from there. And so <laughs> how, how did you get to Simpsons? Uh, Simpsons, basically, like, with the bootleg thing, like I grew up basically Bart Simpson, man. Like I was skating, like fucking hanging out, like doing bad shit. Uh, wasn't necessarily like, like unable to do the schoolwork. I was like very able to do the schoolwork. I just didn't kind of didn't mm -hmm. really care about it. Was getting in trouble and like doing my shit, man, being a flippant little kid. But obviously, I mean, 
that the Simpsons yellow isn't white, but like as a yellow color as default in America, they become like yellow is white. So also in the 90s, being a child of the, of the uh, late 80s, early 90s, the, all the Bart, bootleg Bart stuff, and the, especially the black Bart stuff really spoke to me. And that was like, bro, that's me. Like, that's me right there. So getting into the bootleg world, obviously, I'm going to go with what like what resonates with me and black Bart. And a lot of the black, actually all the Barts and every Bart that I've done, aside from this last release, uh, and also the, uh, I guess he wasn't the release, but the the Mary Mother of God, where he's on the uh, the packaging as Jesus, mm -hmm. our Bart represent is as myself. So it's all things that have influenced me along the way, like music, mm -hmm. skating, like everything. Like, so that's, that's kind of the, that's Wait, why. So, so on the card art, of the Mary figure Bart was yellow? Yeah. So that's that's also kind of the that'll be the telltale also. If if you see if I if Bart is is, is a shade of brown, that's mm -hmm. me as Bart. If it's if the Simpsons yellow, that's that's like a different idea, I guess. So, so you just make the shitty Simpson Barts for me and then for yourself. You do like the true <laughs> reflection of yourself. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, it's not shitty. It's uh, it's 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 uh, I can't be giving you all of myself, man. I, I, I see parts of it. I got to give you parts I, of it. I got it. Um, so what do you think when other Simpsons creators release the same figure, and they release a yellow Bart and a black Bart? Uh, I find. I mean, people can do whatever they want to do. I just don't mm -hmm. find it very authentic. Um, and it's a bit like, I understand that that people feel different ways about different things, but I don't know, like I wouldn't make a figure about something that I don't care about or something that's not a part of me. I don't think that's art. I think that's a kitschy, like trying to make like a little, little bread off a of commodity. And that's kind of weird. It seems really inauthentic to me. Mm -hmm. Is that necessarily what it is? I mean, because don't necessarily, I mean, we don't always necessarily know what someone's heritage or ethnicity is when, of the, of the creator, not always, and it's not necessarily appropriate to ask, but. Yeah, I'm not saying dive in and, and judge the stuff. I'm just saying if, like, if you're, you should make what represents you or what, what represents how you feel, I don't know, mm -hmm. like. I get back. it. I'm not really stepping in other people's shit either. Like, I don't really care. Like, I do my thing, keep my head down. I've learned to uh, kind of keep the majority of stuff at a, at a, a little arm's length distance. Sure. Um, I, there, of course. I, yeah. I mean, in a small community like this, I, I haven't seen anyone who's benefited from talking shit or having beef with anybody else so far. You know, I guess when you get to like, you know, household names and people like start a beef then it's like becomes news newsworthy and maybe that they they benefit from you know from the the controversy if there's two people who and i think some of those beefs are completely made up also um maybe not all of them but i don't know um <laughs> it is what it is um so were you always creative growing up? I mean, how did you get into music? You said you were sculpting as a kid, but I also- I did some sculpting like in like junior high, uh, mm -hmm. but like as a kid, man, I started writing music and like recording songs like on a little like uh, Fisher Price tape recorder when I was like, the the what, for earliest tape that I found was before, I guess it was a preschool tape. Cause mm -hmm. the song is like, I'm going to, Tindergarten, <laughs> Tindergarten. And it was just like me singing, like playing, like my, you know, like those popcorn tins that were ever popular in the early '90s. Uh, sure. Playing those different of different sizes to get different tones, and like writing songs with my cousins. My first group was called the Cousins, but with the K, obviously, because it was. <laughs> uh, wow. And that was yeah, always creative and kind of just doing what what was going on up here. <laughs> wow. Um, so, you know, as a musician, I mean, you're a working musician. Um, I know pandemic has slowed things down for you, but I mean, that was, uh, that's sort of rare, 
right? I mean, that's, I don't want to call it like hitting the jackpot because I know that it's, it ain't a jackpot. <laughs> it's not a jackpot. But as, as far as like the rest of the world is concerned, like if someone wakes up one day and says, I want to be a working musician and support myself with music. I mean, unless you're becoming like a session musician or working in the industry somehow, someone creating their own music, that's kind of the, um, how should I say that? I mean, that's kind of magical right it's it's i know that like now you're doing it you're shaking your head like it's not all it's cracked up to be we know that we've heard the stories like you know you could sell millions of albums and you know still have to keep a day job and stuff like that but um that being a working musician being in a band who releases albums and going on the road and that that's still kind of like just a magical achievement um I see the look on your face and you're like, dude. <laughs> no, no, I, no, no, no. I, I'm just, that's just my face. That's why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you listening and trying to pay attention. Uh, because I, I don't know what the best way to say it is that I, I, that's the dream of millions of people, right? There are millions of people who, who can play adequately, who can even write songs that have a nice, tone or ring to it and you know might not be hit music but who want that you know who want to be on stage for you know the ego the creativity and narcissism whatever the reason is but that's that's a fairly big accomplishment even though like the financial rewards are not you know are really like up at the the top right yeah man it's fun it's a to be it's hard to to like look at it and think of my of it as magical or like a uh, or like um like it's definitely a really unique position and it's I've done a lot of really like unique and cool and fun stuff because of it and like I'm very thankful for it but at the same time like it almost feels like what else am I supposed to do <laughs> like that's mm -hmm. like all I know really and like uh, if I was you know, with pandemic and with like that whole, that being altered, I've been left to really kind of explore like what makes me tick outside of music and like, who am I aside from this fucking rocker dude, you know? Right. And so do you think Toys has, has provided that for you? Yeah, in, in the last, like, actually, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, for the last few years, like Toys has actually kind of taken more of a forefront as like, a, as for in in my like mm -hmm. not for not forefront of like what i'm focusing on what i'm doing because i'm still pushing equally hard in music it's just a little bit more in the background like i'm doing more uh stuff for others at this point but mm -hmm. like it's definitely become more of a uh a bigger part of of my economic landscape sure. <laughs> i don't want to like I, yeah no i, 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 I get it like every, every time I try, I try to say something nice about myself I feel like i'm bragging or saying <laughs> no no it but you don't I'm need to brag because <laughs> i'm saying it for you it's just if you know if you wanted to be an accountant you go to school you know you pass the test you're an accountant right <laughs> if you wanted to be a lawyer it'd be a lot more expensive but you know you go to the classes you pay the money if, as long as you can pass the bar you're an attorney same thing for a doctor for a music for a musician there's not like you know like what is making it like it's like having a, a national stage like yeah i guess um, making it would all be like whatever making it is in your head like i feel like the uh the, as you were saying that like the equivalent of like passing that bar is like maybe going on tour and not not coming back with nothing or like mm -hmm. you know even getting that call continuing to get that phone call like hey bro like you guys want to come play this like that's that i guess that's the success like i it, you, you say like musician and the world stage and stuff like it is all that but like mm -hmm. At the end of the day i'm a punk rock musician man i'm not making like pretty music for people i'm making like sure. music for like the rest of like the outcast and like anyone can listen to it like it's it's not like exclusive but like 
just like the toys, I'm making the music for me and mm -hmm. it, people like me are, are is who it's resonating with and sure. people that aren't like me it's resonating with as well. And it's the kind of like artist for, you know, in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, but it, it, it's interesting that you occupy like these two niches, right? It's like, because the toys are just like a niche of a niche of a niche, right? It's just like, and there's a, you know, I always joke because I went on an episode of Toy Geeks and I, I had this one toy that we were selling and there was only 10 of them. Someone com commented like how terrible the toy was. And I said, I only need to find 10 people who like this for it to be successful. Exactly. And, you know, on the person's comment, I always bring it up. I don't know who they are, but I'm always like harping on them for making this comment like five years ago. I'm like, this is the definition of excellence. Like this person made 10 pieces. They sold 10 pieces. Like they are a hero. Like you make a million pieces and you sell 10, like you're a fucking idiot. Yeah, you know? exactly. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is the odds of making it as a working musician are so infinitesimally small um, that, I mean, do you feel that it's 100% talent driven? No, not at all. Nothing's 100% talent driven ever. To be honest, like a, a lot of music and everything I feel like is uh like environment like the being somewhere right place right time like mm -hmm. and also perseverance man because if you're not putting yourself into position to be in that right place at the right time repeatedly then you're not going to be in that right place so it's like yes you can like there's those like flash in the pan something that's going to do well or something that's kind of like you know catch your eye for a second but if you're not consistently in that spot once mm -hmm. you hit that spot one time then I don't know if you would consider that successful. Right. So what, what do you think would have happened to you had you not found music or music not found you? I don't even know, but, man. <laughs> I mean, would you, would you, did you recognize at some point that like, that this was a, you were a creative person and you had a creative outlet? I, because I think it's fascinating that like you have a music career and then which, like I said, most people would consider is um, just so hard to accomplish, right? And then you find this other creative avenue, you know, making these small editions of toys and like representing yourself, you know, sculpting and casting and, and painting. And that's, again, like such another like small niche to like find yourself in. Like, I'm asking yeah. you to pre predict the past and the future, or whatever. I know, but it's like I, I'd probably—I don't know. Like I would be doing something else to express myself. Like that's always been like uh, I kind of growing up. I always just kind of did what I thought I was supposed to do. But like mm -hmm. expressing myself was always a part of the landscape. Like in the back, like I was always playing in bands as soon as I, as soon as I could, you know. And always, you know, at the same time excuse me, I'm from a small town from Bakersfield, California. So sports is a huge part of the, of youth culture there. So I was playing sports, but then also like playing and, you know, playing music and like trying to be creative and like drawing and, you know, sculpting and just doing all kinds of whatever made, you know, whatever felt right, you know, writing mm -hmm. songs with my cousins and like at every point in my life, there's always been that like, creative like outburst and like even when i'm like even when i was just fully touring like we as a band like fools were stopping on the side of the road to go like paint trains and like go do like other stuff like it was always just like a constant flow of expression and like with music it doesn't always have to just be musical expression like there's merchandise there's like like you could there's everything you can like express yourself in any there's like no limit to it and what it's really cool is that a lot of people are now starting to realize that and like artists are doing toys and experiences and like, you know, restaurant pop-ups and like all different kinds of cool stuff and just invading like this creative space and allowing for like a more ex immersive experience and like lots of people to connect in a really cool way. Did, did someone when you were younger, like point out to you that you were, you know, a creative person and that like you needed an outlet or is that something you had to like, did you have to fight 
you know, was someone pushing you to like do something else and then the creativity won out or did you have support in that way? Uh, mm, not really. Like it was, I mean, I guess as a kid, like you're only like, you're, you're, uh, or for me at least, uh, my my art like in class in class, I guess mm -hmm. that's like the only resistance or like uh, support you would get from that stuff like that. Um, like my parents bought like uh, like art supplies and stuff for me like when I was younger, like so that was supportive. Mm -hmm. um, but like teachers and stuff were always like yeah. probably because I was a talkative like kid doing my own thing and expressing myself in the ways that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I used to get really really bad grades on like my art projects, even though like. I thought they were just as good, if not better than the other kids in the class. Like they might not be exactly what the teacher wanted or, right. you know. Like for example, there was a, a we had a ceramics uh, section and I did, they, we were supposed to do a, what was an object that was taller than like six inches, wider than three and had uh, like a base and some kind of like cut out or something. So we had to like employ like this, like, this paper technique where we fill some of the paper and then it burns out in the kiln or something. Mm -hmm. So I did a toilet because like I could do two basins. I could put a oh and we had also had like a, a removable lid. Yeah. So I had the lid and it was just like a it was a toilet. It looked great. And but mm -hmm. I did brown in the bottom with my with my shellac because <laughs> why wouldn't I? I was a seventh grade. <laughs> and it looked great, man. It it stood the fire, it stayed in, stayed together, but I was getting the same grade as kids that pieces were falling apart or like looked like shit or had holes like and it's like, okay, why is that? So like, maybe that, maybe maybe that re just reinforced like, all right, this lady doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. Like, my shit's tight. <laughs> you know, you know, their clay stuff is whack. Is whack. Wow. <laughs> the teacher that's whack. A, my shit a... is tight as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I think that's what most artists I know struggle with is is dealing with, I guess it's, it's just confidence, right? Um, yeah, most, sure. Most, I don't know that I would be said I was confident about stuff. But, but, but that, that is a certain confidence at an early age. Like you thought to yourself, most people would, would listen to what the teacher said. And if they didn't get a good grade, would believe them, you know, and, and take that, internalize that and say, oh, I am not good, right? And you sort of did, you're telling me at least that you did the opposite. You were like, fuck you, you yeah. don't know what you're talking about. Like I put shit in the pot, man, it's fucking rad. For sure, for sure. I think I internalized something else from that though. I think I internalized the acceptance part. Which, what does that mean? Which was like, uh, all right, I'm not gonna be accepted for what I'm doing. So like, let's just keep, keep running it. <laughs> that you were gonna keep going regardless of what people said around you yeah yeah well i mean isn't that the sort of like did you just go get yourself a refill your beverage yes sir we were normal for a second <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing but I, it's that stick to itiveness right it's the you know it's that whatever that japanese proverb you know it's like you get knocked down you only have to get get back up one more time than you've been knocked down right yeah, exactly. There's there's a chumba wumba. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, uh, yeah, you take a whiskey drink. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, definitely. You just got to keep getting back up and running, doing it. Like, and if it's not working this way, start working mm -hmm. going that way. If it's not working that way, go this way. Like, right. You only you only fail when you stop trying. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm always like, have been like a risk averse person. And I'm always like very calculated and just don't take a lot of like chances. For sure. Um, and I see other people, cause like the tortoise and the hare and I'm always like the tortoise. And then I see the hares like running around, like just doing shit like really fast and getting stuff done and then I'm always sort of jealous, but then anytime I try to be the hair, I just get like put back in my place, like slow and steady, buddy. Keep going slow. And I'm just like, I was always very impatient to be the to be the tortoise. I always felt like the hair, mm -hmm. but like with like 
way more distractions and like a butterfly <laughs> and then like you know like a like a squirrel on my shoulder like telling me some shit and like <laughs> <laughs> so um like when you're a musician is there a, a long-term plan like is that something you can do forever or that has a, a time span like a life is that a young person's shit man i don't even know uh so i mean our toys no, like i guess are... not like i got some uh, some peers that are in their 50s that are like still really doing their thing and mm -hmm. so i guess it's not really a young person's game mm -hmm. um but you just got to make it like like anything like you got to make what you're doing work for you and your situation uh like who knows man maybe i'll be like maybe i'll be doing stuff like you in a few years oh yeah what am i doing distributing man selling other people's toys Get uh, the, the word out spreading the good word there you go so w what's the future where does it go from here uh for dogman yeah all right so this year is going to be a year and we're already about mostly like halfway through it at least or over halfway through it because we're, we're in august now july kind of fucked it, up right yeah it's pretty fucked up so maybe next year <laughs> no, no, it just kind of just spread the but I, like I, was I saw this meme and it's like you know it's like um 2020 is like it was like eight months ago and you're like what we're all you know it's like we're four months from like 2022 and it's like what where the fuck did my last two years go like everyone's just sort of been in the twilight zone but anyway go on uh I was oh, asking yeah. you where, oh, where where Dogman's going and where Spencer going. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of collaboration. Um, working on some figures. Going to be doing some vinyl stuff potentially this year. I've got some stuff in the works. Uh, some collaboration with some friends. Um, and some events. <laughs> <laughs> and more uh, Dogman releases. Maybe some more <laughs> storm <-out> stuff. <laughs> some yeah. Uh, yeah some and more uh, bigger pieces <laughs> <laughs> wow I, I think you've actually missed your calling as a stand-up comedian um and, like I'm actually sitting down right now yeah and do you think um i mean it sounds to me like the future for you is always doing something creative I mean, do you, yeah. do you um do you ever see yourself branching out into other things like like uh how do you, how do you mean like uh, other, like, like other forms of creativity like is this maybe maybe if, if i if i learn about something at some point i, I find that i kind of uh find of i throughout my life i found very like niche like interest and just really just dove head first into them with like with music and stuff, ready for the dog to go with nuts. The male's here. We'll live. Ooh, good job, Cody. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I just kind of just dove head first into what I was doing and then just like somehow, I don't know how, but it's always kind of like I've found myself being decent at it mm -hmm. and just kind of done it and that's what I do. So I'm sure at some point I'll find something else. Um, but ideally, I'd like to to continue. Uh, oh, there he goes. To continue making toys and maybe just like up to scale it up a little bit. I like to uh, maybe start doing some stuff for some uh, other people more in the limelight because I've been doing like as you were saying a lot of commissions behind the behind mm -hmm. the the wizard's uh, veil. Right, right. Doing uh, stuff sort of like doesn't have your name on it, but maybe like commissions and stuff where it's like a dogman collaboration that kind of thing. Exactly, like. I guess I'll let the cat out of the bag and I'll probably, I probably won't end up doing it now because I'm saying it, but ideally the idea is to have two separate entities of Dogman. One branch is entirely handmade resin, mm -hmm. one-offs and small run stuff where you're getting the premium hand of the dog. Right. The other side would essentially be uh, like all commissions and like collaborations on a larger scale. Um, sure. Mostly parted out, potentially bringing in other artists to help um and kind of making like more of like a community thing i want to bring in more black artists um love what you're doing bringing in more female artists like let's give the voice to the voiceless man we're trying it's um 
it's it's so hard uh, you know you're doing my best here to like be inclusive um it's uh i mean I, i'm proud of the fact that like we have toys on this table from eight different countries you know that's um i love seeing work from people of different countries it, it's especially hard with with women um being that the medium is traditionally a boy's toy you know what i mean it's like if i was selling bootlegs of barbie dolls like it might be switched you know swapped like it might have trouble finding men um who are like in that field but you know it uh it's rough yeah but it uh you know something to aspire <laughs> to i guess um you just amplify right. the voices that are there yeah i mean um yeah, and my favorite stuff that I collect and this favorite stuff that I sell has always been the political stuff. I mean, it's always the commentary. It's always the commentary about, you know, culture and politics um, communicated through a toy. I think, I mean, there's something already political about just going and uh, about all of this and just, like you said, just you're making your own version of Bart, right? It's taking something from pop culture which is like this commodity that's being sold to you and you're taking it and like regurgitating it back like you know either in your own image or with your own statement or however you know each artist is doing it and so that's that's political in and of itself but then when you actually use it as a platform to communicate something um that's when that, that's when it really like hits me like that that's my favorite kind of work i guess so, yeah, it's, it, it hits all your, uh, it plays your heartstrings. Yes, if I have any of those left. <laughs> Dev, you got a big heart. Don't don't sell yourself short, man. Uh, oh man, now you're gonna make me cry. All right, dude. Well, I, uh, I I really appreciate all you do. Um, I I love uh, all of your work. I have so much of it. I. I expecting there's going to be so much more over the years um, and i'm glad that this is working out for you as a you know a medium for you to excel at because it's uh it you know it, it's fun to like watch the ride i guess of a lot of these artists and see like where they've started and where they're going and how the the evolution takes place um, so keep up the good work man i really Appreciate it. Appreciate you making this toy for us this year and congratulations on it selling out. And uh... thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Black Heart Edition coming soon from Dogman. So nice. Everybody in the comment section, come check it out. <laughs> also got some big boys coming. This is a terracotta, oh, wow. terracotta warrior, 12 inch uh, stormtrooper. But these heads are actually all uh, individually unique. It's going to be limited to 100. And each head is different, sculpted wow. pieces onto uh, cast resin. And this head was from a bobblehead that actually came from the Terracotta Warriors in China when I was there. Wow. So uh, come check it out. That's Not just dope. <laughs> yeah, coming awesome, soon. Dude. Big boys. Very cool. All right. Thank, thank you, you dude. Really appreciate Sorry. the time. Well, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Take care. Awesome.